What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The Book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. The Book of Revelation provides penetrating insight into the future. It reveals the plans of God. It unmasks the plans of Satan. And one of the devil's greatest deceptions has to do with spiritualism. It has to do with the impersonation of our dead loved ones by evil spirits. We're going to study that in this presentation and give you hope and confidence to face the future. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that Jesus is our hope that Jesus is our security, that Jesus is our refuge, and that truth is greater than all the deceptions of Satan, and that the Word of God will beat back falsehood. Open our minds to understand your truth. In Christ's name, amen. My topic during this presentation is Revelation Reveals Deadly Delusions. One of Satan's deadliest delusions has to do with what happens when you die. There are many different ideas about what happens when a person dies. And the question also is, can we find hope beyond the grave? A hope that goes beyond the tomb. A hope that pierces the darkness of night. What really happens when you die? What takes place five minutes after death. Is it heaven? Is it hell? Is it nothingness? If we went out and took a survey about what happens when you die, and if we asked five different people, they, one might say, oh, when you die, nothing, that's it, it's the grave. You go into the grave, the ground, and you stay there. Somebody else might say, well, you're reincarnated to a variety of life forms. Somebody else might say, well, when you go to die, you go immediately to heaven or you go to hell. Somebody else might say, when you die, you rest until the coming of Christ. The real answer to the problem of death, of course, must be found in the Bible. We can have a variety of opinions about death, but what Scripture says is authoritative because the author of life reveals secrets about death. Are the dead asleep waiting for the resurrection when Jesus comes? Or are they in heaven already? Many Christians are quite confused about that point. Sometimes you'll go to a funeral and the preacher will say, well, your dead loved ones are up in heaven looking down upon you. Then a few paragraphs later in the sermon he will say, well, your dead loved ones will be resurrected when Jesus comes. And you sit out there confused, where are they? Some say, well, there is kind of a spirit being up in heaven, but that spirit being has to be reunited with the body when it's resurrected. But then you say, if the spirit lives in heaven, what is it? Does it have eyes? Does it have, have hands? Uh, and why does it need to be re reunited with the body if it's already up there for hundreds of years? The Bible is much simpler than that, much plainer than that, and much less confusing. And we're going to study in this presentation to answer the mystery of death. Now, to understand death, we really have to understand this idea of immortality. Is the soul immortal or is there a resurrection? See, if you have an immortal soul that wings its way to heaven after you die, why would you need a resurrection of the body anyway? So we have to look at what does the Bible teach about immortality? Do we have it now? Will we have it in the future? Do we have an immortal soul? Is the thing called the soul immortal? What is the soul? And what about the resurrection that the Bible teach about, teaches about? Where can we find answers? Now, the truth of the matter is we can find answers. We find answers deeply embedded in Scripture. We find answers in the Word of God. The book of Revelation helps us to understand the mystery of death. You go to Revelation. The revelation of who, everybody? Jesus Christ. And Scripture says in Revelation 1, verse 18, Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Christ was alive. 
crucified on the cross, went into the grave, but was resurrected from the dead. It was at that point that he said, I'm going to my Father. Remember, Mary tried to cling to his feet and he said, touch me not, I'm ascending to the Father. So you have the idea of death, rest in the tomb over Sabbath, resurrection, Jesus ascending to heaven. But notice what Jesus says, I have the keys of Hades and death, Hades the grave. Now notice, this is incredibly good news. The death is not some locked up tomb prison in the earth. Jesus said, I have the keys. You need not fear death. Why, we need, why don't we need to fear death? First, Jesus already experienced it, and he already conquered the grave. Death is a defeated foe. Every time Jesus faced death, Jesus won and death lost. Every time Christ faced the grave, he came out victorious. And he demonstrated his power over the grave by raising from the dead many who had died in New Testament periods of times, children and adults. Why we, don't we need to fear death? Because Christ has conquered the grave. He went into the grave and came out, and because he has the keys to the grave, death is an unlocked mystery through Jesus. The Bible also teaches that one day he will come again. And one day the dead in Christ will be resurrected. You remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. It talks about the coming of Jesus. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. We need not fear death. Jesus is coming again. We can see our loved ones again. What does the Bible teach about the idea of the immortal soul? Does the Bible teach that the soul is immortal? Well, let's go back to the book of Genesis because if we understand how God created the human race, we can also understand about what happens when we die. So let's go back to Genesis. The Bible says in Genesis 2 verse 7, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now notice what the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say that God put an immortal soul in human beings when they were created. What does it say? God formed man. God fashioned man. God shaped man out of what? The dust of the earth. And man became a living soul as God breathed his life-giving breath into it. We might look at it this way. Dust, that's the dust of the earth that God created man from, and God's spirit breathed into man creates a living soul. Or we could say it this way, the elements of earth plus God's breath equals a living being. See, in the Bible, the soul is not something put into a human being that is immortal. But in the Bible, a human being is a living soul. The body plus the breath equals a living soul. So in the Bible, part of the time the word soul is used, it is used as something I am. I am the product of body and breath. I am a living soul, a living being, a living personality. A living soul simply means a living being or a living personality. A living being, living soul means a living person. It means an individual who's thinking, functioning, and breathing. Now, what is the soul? Is it immortal? Can the soul ever die? Look what the Bible says very clearly. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. Next verse. The soul who sins shall die. So can the soul die, everybody? What does the Bible say? The soul that does what? Sins. How else might you read that passage? Same way we read Genesis 2 verse 7. The person, the living being that sins is going to die. So let's go back to Genesis again. You remember? God created man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living what? Soul or being or personality. Person, the soul who sins. What's going to happen to them? They're going to die. 
So here, the Bible is very plain. The word soul simply can mean in the Bible living being. Now, another name for soul in the Bible is person or life. Two-thirds of the time, the Bible uses the term soul. It's for life. One-third is for person. Sometimes the Bible talks about the soul as something we are, the product of body and breath. Sometimes the Bible uses the term soul as something we have, two-thirds of the time, in fact. But it's never that we have an immortal soul. We have life. We have life. A good example of that is found in Matthew 16, verse 25 and 26. The Bible says, whoever desires to save his what? Life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will do what? Find it. Then he goes on to say, verse 26, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own what? Soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So in the earlier verse, it talks about losing your life. Then this verse, it talks about losing your soul. It talks about preserving your life or preserving your soul. So, so when the Bible talks about soul, it can be talking about life. So what happens when we die? When we die, our life is no more. So the Bible never talks about soul in the sense of immortal soul. In fact, the Bible uses the term soul 1,600 times. How many was that? Did you get it? 1,600 times. Never once does it put the word immortal with soul. Never once does it link those two things together. Wouldn't you think if human beings had an immortal soul that at least it would be linked once together in Scripture? It is never linked together. Now, only God is immortal. Mortal means subject to death. Immortal means imperishable. The Bible never uses the terms immortal soul or the immortality of the soul. In fact, the Bible is always speaking about Jesus as the one who is immortal. 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Immortality is something that God has. Job chapter 4, verse 17 says, Shall mortal man be more just than his maker? We are mortal. Romans chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 says, We seek for immortality. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 says, We put on immortality when Christ comes. So we are mortal. We seek for immortality. We put it on when Christ comes. Only Jesus, only God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have immortality. Now notice, 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 and 16. He who is blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Who's that? The King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is that? That's Jesus, of course. Who alone, what's the word, everybody? What's that word? Who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. So God alone has immortality. Now look, if I alone have my Bible. What does that mean? If I say I am the only one, I alone have my Bible, it means you don't have it, right? It means that it's my exclusive possession. So when it says God alone has immortality, it means that nobody else has it. We seek for it. We look for the day that will be clothed with immortality when Jesus comes. But according to the Bible, God alone, His Son Christ and the Holy Spirit are the only ones that have immortality. Where did this idea of the immortality of the soul come from? Where did it come from, my friends? The pagan Greek philosophy taught that the soul is immortal. In ancient writings of Strabo called Graphic Geographica, Strabo says this, talking about the sum. He says, they invent fables also after the manner of Plato on the immortality of the soul and on the punishments in Hades and other things of this kind. He's speaking about Christians who've drifted away from Christ, who have Greek, accepted Greek philosophy. And he says they, they invent fables after the matter of Plato, such as the immortality of the soul. The Greeks believed that the soul was immortal and it would leave the body at death. 
Also, this idea of the immortality of the soul can be traced back to the Babylonians, can be traced back to the Egyptian culture. Many pagan cultures had this idea, but the Bible constantly taught that indeed the soul was not something that was immortal. It's something we are, the product of body and breath. God created man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of the spirit of life. Man becomes a living being, a living soul. Or the soul represents our life. We die, we no longer breathe, that life is over. Justin Martyr was an early Christian leader, lived from 100 to 165 A.D. In the Antinocene Fathers, volume 1, page 239, he gives this warning. He says, if you've fallen in with some who are called Christians, but who do not admit this truth of the resurrection and venture to blaspheme the God of Abraham and of Isaac and the God of Jacob, and who say there is no resurrection of the dead and that their souls when they die are taken to heaven, do not imagine that they're Christians. That's an amazing statement from one of the early church fathers who clearly understood that the scriptures teach that death is but a rest, a sleep, until the resurrection, that there is nothing like the immortality of the soul found in the Bible. It rather comes from Greek philosophy. Now, spiritualism teaches that the soul is immortal. And if you accept the idea of the immortality of the soul, then that leaves you very open, very vulnerable to spiritualism. The book of Revelation speaks of spiritualistic delusions in the last days of earth's history. And the devil is preparing men and women through a false understanding or a misunderstanding of death. The devil is preparing men and women through that misunderstanding of death on the idea of the immortal soul. The devil can use these ideas about death to deceive us. The devil can use these ideas about death to lead us down the pathway of destruction. The Bible says in Job 7 verse 9, as the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who do, goes down to the grave does not come up. You see, spiritualism says this, that there's an immortal soul that leaves the body at death, and that under the right conditions that this immortal soul, this being that has died and still lives can communicate with the living. But the Bible says, death is but asleep till the resurrection. It says, just like the cloud disappears and vanishes, the person who goes down to the grave is not going to come up. When a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. The Bible says that the person who dies can't return to his house one night. I was in the Philippines sharing these marvelous truths from the Word of God, the truth that death is but a rest, the truth of the marvels of the resurrection, the truth that when you die, you cannot return to your house. A Filipino army officer came to our meetings. His wife had died a number of years before. One night, there was a great storm. And as he went home after the meeting, the storm got more furious. Hid the shutters on his house were blowing, the wind was blowing, the rain was pouring down. And as he lay on his bed, unable to sleep, he looked up and he saw a form. He told me the story later. And as he saw this form, it was the form of his wife. She looked more beautiful than ever before. She reached out and said, oh, darling, hug me. And he looked up. And he remembered our meetings that the Bible does not teach an immortal soul. He remembered our meetings that when you die, you can no longer come back to your house, that you will not return. And he looked up and he said, I know, because he remembered revelation. He remembered the spirits of demons would try to deceive. He said, I know you're not my wife. I know you're a demon. In the name of Jesus Christ, be gone. And he said, right before his eyes, she turned to a vicious demon and was gone. You see, my friends, this is more than some academic exercise. But as you understand what the Bible really teaches about death, as you understand what the Bible teaches about the immortal soul, God will protect you in the crisis. That's why it's so vital to understand these truths about the book of Revelation. See, Oliver Lodge, an English spiritualist, put it this way. There is no death in the graveyard. 
I have frequent talks with the dead. I cannot doubt that people live after death, for I frequently talk with them. Spiritualism is dependent on the idea of the immortal soul. Sir Oliver Lodge was a world-renowned physicist. He was an ardent proponent of communication with the dead. His son Raymond was killed in action in World War I on September 14, 1915. And Oliver Lodge and his wife communicated with a spiritualist medium and they began receiving so-called messages from their son. Contrary to the teaching of the Bible, Arthur Lodge denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus. He rejected the idea that for believers, death was asleep until the second coming of Christ. You know, the Barner Group reports that seven million teens have encountered an angel, demon, or some other supernatural being. And can you believe this, my friend? More than two million teens say they've communicated with a dead person, and nearly two million youth claim they've psychic powers. The teachings of Oliver Lodge, that spiritualist from England, are still impacting America and Europe today. They still are influencing scores and scores of teens today, preparing the world for the overwhelming surprise that the devil is bringing upon the world through spiritualism. When you turn away from the Word of God, when you turn away from the clear teachings of His Word, it prepares you for the deceptions of the devil. The book of Revelation reveals the plans of God. The book of Revelation unmasks the plans of Satan. The Bible teaches that death is like a sleep. The believer who dies is as secure as if he were sleeping or she were sleeping in the arms of Jesus Christ. Safe in the arms of Jesus. That's the message that Jesus gives to us in the Bible. More than 53 times in the Bible, death is mentioned as asleep. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, is going to tell us the mystery of death. He's going to solve that mystery. We shall not all, what everybody? We shall not all what? Sleep. But we shall be changed. When? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. Now let's pause here. When you die, it's just as secure as sleeping in the arms of Jesus. You die and you just rest. There's no pain, there's no suffering, and notice there's no passing of time. It says, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, when you fall asleep, what's the next thing that you know? You wake up, right? I've been standing on the great platforms of the world and stadiums and in auditoriums and gymnasiums and churches for about 50 years. And when my children were very young, we'd bring them to the meetings. And very often, I remember my boy particularly, my wife sometimes would take a blanket and put it by the side of the stage because he'd love to watch me. And he would, she would sit next to him and he'd have a little comfortable bed and he'd fall asleep when daddy was preaching. That's okay for my son to fall asleep when I'm preaching, but, but, but you better not. Um, but anyway, he'd fall asleep. After the meeting, he'd be sleeping away, and I would pick him up, and we'd bring him to the car. We were in New England in those days, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, where it snowed a lot. And maybe the roads were icy, I don't know, and we'd be going home, and maybe a truck comes by us, and I dodge it. You know, he doesn't know anything about that. He's sleeping. I lay him in his little crib. The next morning... My wife and I go in to see our son, and I say, son, how you doing? He's bright-eyed, and he looks up, and he says, daddy, are we still at church? Are you still preaching? I say, well, son, I preach long, but not that long. <laughs> you see, he didn't know anything about the passage of time, didn't he? What did he know? He just knew that his dad was preaching. He fell asleep, and the next thing he knew, he woke up. So that's all death is. Nothing to be feared. If you're a believer... We simply fall asleep and we rest. The next moment, the next instant, the next conscious thinking moment, we see Christ coming. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So we're changed in a moment, in an instant, changed from 
mortality to immortality to receive these glorious new bodies in Christ. Now when God created Adam, he placed his breath within him, not an immortal soul. The Bible says, Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So notice what he's breathing into him. It's the breath of life. Man becomes a living soul. What is this breath that God breathes into him? You see, death is creation in reverse. Death is nothing more than creation in reverse. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, then the dust will return to the earth when we die, as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Now notice it doesn't say the soul will return to God who gave it. This is where many people make a big mistake. They think the soul and the spirit are the same thing. They are not. The spirit is nothing more than the breath that God breathed into us initially. The Old Testament word for spirit is ruach, and it means breath. So God breathes his breath or his spirit into us. What goes back to God? The power of God that he has given us to sustain life. The spirit and the soul are different in the Bible. The soul is something that we are. We are the product of body and breath. The soul has to do with our life. The spirit is the breath of God that sustains or gives us that life. When God breathed into it, we lived. When he breathed into that body, we lived. If he wouldn't have breathed his life into it, we would not have lived. So the breath of life, the spirit of life, the life-giving force, energy of God enables us to live. Every breath we take is dependent on the very life of God. When we die, we go back to the earth. The breath goes back or spirit goes back to him. And we await in sleep that resurrection. The spirit or breath of life, the power of life, goes back to God. The Bible teaches that the breath and the spirit are the very, very same thing. They are one in Scripture. The Bible teaches, in fact, that look at Job chapter 27 and verse 3. Often there's something called Hebrew parallelism. God says something in the first verse. He explains it in the latter part of that verse. Notice, all the while my breath is where? In me, and the Spirit of God is where? In my nostrils. Same thing, breath equals spirit. Can you say that? The breath equals what? Spirit. So somebody says explain it and make it plain. So let's suppose that the light bulb represents our body. So this represents our body, or we're created out of the dust of the ground. Let's suppose the electricity represents the spirit or the breath. So somebody turn on the light, throw the switch. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so when the power comes through the power cord representing the breath or spirit to the light bulb, what happens? There is illumination. So to have illumination, what do you need? Do you need just power and the cord? No. You need what? A light bulb. But if you just have a light bulb, do you have illumination? No, you need power. The spirit represents the power. The light bulb is represented by the body. Now, if you turn off the power, please turn off the power, thank you. Okay, if you turn off the power, what happens? The electricity goes back to the powerhouse. What happens to the bulb? It no longer has illumination. When a person dies, the spirit goes to God. The body, represented by the light bulb, is buried in the earth. And the person's true life is hid with Christ in God. They no longer exist as a living soul. They no longer exist as a living being. That which goes back to God is not something that thinks. It's not something that feels. It's not something that's some conscious entity. Since the power to create life is with God, his spirit which gave life returns to God. Is there any consciousness in death? Any thought processes going on in death? The Bible says, Psalm 146 verse 4, his breath, that's the spirit of God, goes forth. He returns to his earth that is his body in that very day what happens his thoughts perish 
You, so if there was some immortal soul, which the Bible doesn't teach, that went back to God, what would happen to the thought processes? They would continue. But the Bible says the thought processes do what? His thoughts perish. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5 and 6 makes it so plain. Notice what it says. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. How much do the dead know, everybody? How much do they know? They know what? That's right, the dead know not anything. The Bible continues, their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. If a person went immediately to heaven, they would have to have love to love God. They would notice if they went immediately to hell, they would have hatred or envy. But the Bible says, the living know that they shall die. But the dead know how much? The dead don't know anything. Every emotion is ceased. Why? Because they're resting. Resting until Jesus comes. Resting till they receive their final reward. Resting until the resurrection of righteousness or the resurrection of unrighteousness. Death is a sleep until Christ's coming. And the Bible writers mention this, as we've described it, mentioned it already over 50 different times. Let me give you some examples. Psalm 13, verse 3. Consider and hear me, David says, O Lord my God, enlighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. What did David believe about death? He believed that it was a sleep. He believed that it was a rest until the coming of Christ. We find this throughout the entire Old Testament. Jesus taught as well that death was a sleep. Jesus taught as well that death was a rest. There was an occasion where Jesus' friend died, Lazarus. And uh, Lazarus had become very, very sick previous to that. And Jesus got word that Lazarus was sick. Jesus waited before going. He waited a couple days, and by the time he got there, since there was a journey, he was in the Galilee, and Lazarus was in Bethany. It was four days. This is a time that Jesus was four days late, but right on time. You know, why didn't Jesus wait? Why, why did Jesus wait, rather? Why didn't Jesus just go to Lazarus? Because he wanted to work a miracle that was greater than healing sickness. He was going to work a miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And so, in John chapter 11, verse 11 to 14, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. And Jesus says, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I'm going to, make, I'm going to wake him up. Well, they thought, wait a minute, if Lazarus is sleeping, he's going to get well. He, he's, this is not to death. And Jesus said, our friend Lazarus does what? Our friend Lazarus does what? Our friend Lazarus is sleeping. They thought, this is good news. Because if you're sick and you sleep, maybe the fever breaks. Maybe the sickness is over. And then Jesus said, however, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. And then Jesus makes it plain. Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So they clearly understood. Now, how did Jesus treat death? What did Jesus say to his closest followers? Did he say to them, now don't worry at all about Lazarus? Because sure, he's dead, but he has this immortal soul and it's going up to heaven. Not at all. No such teaching in the Bible. And Jesus certainly didn't believe that. He simply said, Lazarus is sleeping. And then Jesus said, Lazarus is what? Lazarus is dead. So Christ then went to the home of Mary and Martha. And as he talked to the sister of Lazarus, Jesus said to her, your brother's going to rise again. And she said, oh Lord, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. And I know he's going to rise again in the last day. Here, this sister of Lazarus, who got her religion directly from Jesus, Mary said, I know he's going to rise the last day in the resurrection. Jesus looks at her and recognizes that she understands the truth about death. What did Martha believe about death? She believed 
that her faithful brother would rise in the resurrection, she did not believe that he was up in heaven looking down upon her. She learned her religion directly from Jesus, and she believed in the resurrection. When? At the last day. All the great men and women of faith in the Old and New Testament believe that. Remember what Paul said there, writing to Timothy? He said, my life is being poured out, and I wait the righteous judge who will have the crown of life for me in the last day. Paul believed that Christ was going to come again and that he, if he died in that Roman prison, that he would be resurrected in the last day. All believers believe that. John believed it, exiled on the island of Patmos. Paul believed it. Mary believed it. Martha believed it. Jesus taught it. So Mary and Martha were crying, not because they thought Lazarus is up in heaven, but because of the pain and the agony of separation from him until the resurrection at the last day. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. In other words, though that person dies, they, though they go into the grave, they are going to live again. They will be resurrected from the dead. That death will not hold its victims. The grave will not keep its victims. That death is not a long night without a morning. The tomb is not simply a dark hole in the ground. So Jesus said, if you believe, you, your brother is going to live again to demonstrate his power over death, to demonstrate his power over the grave, to demonstrate his ability over death. Jesus comes to that grave, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of the grave, rises to new life. He had been in that grave four days. Now look, my friend, Lazarus comes out of the tomb. New life, Jesus says to those who see him, loose him and let him go. He was all bandaged up with the grave clothes. Life is pulsating through his body. There's a new smile on his face. There's a new sparkle in his eyes. There's a new spring in his step. I can just imagine he comes and he embraces Christ. Now look, if what some people believe is true, you know, you have to notice, Jesus didn't say, Lazarus, come down. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. If what some people believe is actually true, you know, if I were Lazarus, what I'd have done? I'd have done this. If I were up in heaven for four days, rejoicing in glory, if I were fellowshipping with the angels, if I were eating from the tree of life, and Jesus said, come down, I would have yelled back from heaven if I were Lazarus, Nothing doing, Lord. I'm not coming. You just called the wrong name, Lord. You just called the wrong person. I'm up here in glory. I'm rejoicing in the kingdom of God. I am not coming back. If anybody could have given a testimony about life after death, it would have been Lazarus. If he were up in glory, think of the books he could have written that would have been sold throughout the Middle East, throughout Jerusalem, on life after death. But Lazarus had nothing to say. Why not? Because he wasn't in glory, he was resting, sleeping there in the tomb. Resting like every believer will rest until the coming of Jesus. With no pain, no suffering, no heartache, no sorrow, no death. Resting. The Bible says in Job chapter 14 verse 21, his sons come to honor and he does not know it. They are brought low and he does not perceive it. Somebody says, Pastor Mark, I like to think of my mother up in heaven. I like to think of her looking down at me. It just gives me comfort. Would it be comfort for a mother up in heaven if her son was drafted off to war and the enemy captured him and tortured him and gouged out his eyes and gouged out his tongue, and tortured him mercilessly. Could that mother be happy in heaven? Well, what about a mother up in heaven looking down and here's her little five-year-old and he's kicking a ball and he kicks it out in the street and the car screeches, doesn't see the boy, crushes him and the boy's a quadriplegic for the rest of his life. Would that mother up in heaven be happy? Or think of fathers in heaven seeing their daughters beaten brutally by some angry man. Isn't God's plan so much better, my friend? 
our loved ones in heaven. Don't see children that have gone astray, gotten involved in drugs and alcohol. Our mothers and fathers are not up there in heaven looking down upon the conflicts in families and the wars on earth. Our fathers and mothers are not up in heaven. Death is a state of perfect rest or sleep until the resurrection. When Christ wakes you up and says, now all the sorrow is over. Now all the heartache is over. Now all the disappointments are over. You see, my friend, God's way is so much better. We are sheltered in his arms in that perfect sleep. Our true life, the record of our life is hid with Christ in God. He, this all-powerful, infinite God, knows our identity. It is in his hands. Our bodies go to the earth. The life, the breath goes back to God. There is no conscious existence. We rest until the Christ comes in the next moment we see him coming down the carters of the sky. The Bible says, Psalm 115, verse 17, the dead do not what? The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any that go down into silence. If you went up to heaven when you died, you'd at least praise the Lord, right? Wouldn't that, that be what you were doing? But the Bible says, the dead praise not the Lord. 53 times, death is asleep in the Bible. 1,600 times the Bible uses the word soul, never uses immortal soul. The Bible says in the, that very day their thoughts perish, Psalm 6 verse 5. Psalm 115 verse 17, the Bible says the dead praise not the Lord. Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6, the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. The Bible is very plain. God's plan is so much better than human tradition. The immortality of the soul comes in through Greek philosophy and according to Revelation will be preparing the world for an overwhelming deception. The Bible says that the works of the dead follow them. It says that those that die in Christ have works which follow them. You know when a father or mother dies, and they've taught their children about the things of Jesus. Those children have that inclination for Christ in their hearts, that inclination for Christ in their lives, and they have that desire to follow Christ. And the works of the parents still follow them, and one day that child will, making choices to follow Christ because of an influence of their parents will be in heaven with Jesus and their parents to rejoice forever and ever and ever and ever. God's word is so plain. God's word is so clear about this subject of death. But somebody says, Pastor Mark, wasn't there the story of Jesus and uh, the story of the thief on the cross who died? And didn't the Bible indicate that he would be in heaven with Christ? Well, look, when you have text after text after text that talks about the second coming of Christ, when you have passage after passage in Scripture that talks about the return of Christ, you do not take one Bible text out of context regarding the thief on the cross and throw on, out these clear texts on the coming of Christ that talk about the resurrection of the body. So you say, but, but Pastor Mark, help us to understand about the text on the thief on the cross. Didn't Jesus say, you will be with me in paradise today? Remember, well, that Jesus is hanging on the cross. There's a thief on the left, thief on the right. One thief says, if you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. Jesus, hanging there with nails through his hands, with blood running down his wrists, with a crown of thorns upon his head, looks like he cannot save anybody. The other thief turns to Christ, and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Nobody has asked that question. Nobody has made that request. Nobody has made that appeal genuinely and sincerely and been turned away by Christ. Now you'll recall that Christ died on the cross on Friday. He rested in the tomb on Sabbath. He was resurrected from the dead on Sunday. And you will also remember 
that Mary comes to him on Sunday morning after the resurrection, falls at his feet, and what does Jesus say? John 20, verse 15, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? What, whom are you seeking? She thinks he's the gardener and says to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, if you've taken my Lord away, please tell me where he is. Tell me where you've laid him, and I'm going to take him away and give him a proper burial. And what does Jesus say to her? Jesus says, Mary, Rabboni, which is to say teacher, don't cling to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren, saying, I am ascending, present tense, right now, to your Father and, my, and your, my Father and your Father and my God and your God. What does Jesus say to Mary on Sunday? I have not yet, what? Ascended to the Father. How could Jesus have said to the thief on Friday that they would be together in paradise if Christ had not ascended yet to the Father on Sunday morning. Certainly, Jesus did not ascend on Friday. So what was really going on there? Jesus is hanging on the cross. And what does he say? He says, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, it all depends where you put the comma in that passage. If you put the comma after the word today, it's clear. If you put it before, it's a little fuzzy. If you quote the text this way, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise, it appears that Jesus would be in paradise with the thief that day. But if you say, I say to you today, comma, I say to you today, comma, you will in the future be with me in paradise, it makes so much more sense. You say, how do you know where to put the comma? Well, first, there were no commas in the original text. That did not come until the 1300s, much later. But look, you don't take a misplaced comma and throw out 53 texts that say the death is but asleep. Throw out all the texts that talk about the resurrection. And you don't deny Scripture when Jesus himself says that he did not ascend to the Father on, until Sunday. What did Jesus mean when he said to the thief? Here's what he meant. He said, I say to you today, this day that I'm dying on the cross, this day that there's nails in my hands, this day that there's a crown of thorns upon my head, this day that it doesn't look like I can save anybody. I say to you this day, I make that declaration that I will be resurrected from the dead. I will ascend to the Father. I remember you. I remember you when I come into heaven in paradise. And Jesus says that to you. When you say, Lord, remember me. Remember me and all my guilt. Remember me and all my shame. Remember me, Father. Remember me, dear Jesus. Touch my heart, O Holy Spirit. I feel convicted. I must come to you. Remember me, Jesus says. I accept you, my child. I'll forgive you, my child. I'll change your life, my child. You will be with me in paradise. You need not fear death because I have conquered the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus gives us victory over sin. Jesus gives us victory over the grave. Jesus gives us victory over death. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Have you lost some loved one by death? Some father, some mother. You still miss your dad, your mom. My father and mother have both passed away. Near as I travel the world, I have an international cell phone. And I, every place I would go, I'd take out my cell phone and call my dad. And even now, I find myself reaching into my pocket at times for that cell phone. You see, my dad and I had a very close bond, a very close relationship. He led me to Jesus Christ. He led me to the Savior. 
He shared the Word of God with me. I miss him. I long for that day that Jesus will come. Have you lost some husband or wife, some father or mother, some sister or brother, some son or daughter? They're not lost. If they're a believer in Christ, they are resting where they can never be lost. Their true life, the record of that life, their identity is hid with Christ in God. They are resting from the pain, the heartache, the sorrow, the tears of life. They know no passage of time. The next thing they will know is the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. And as Jesus comes, that little baby mama will be put in your arms again. She'll reach up and hug your face again. You can look into the eyes of that child one day once again. That son or daughter, long lost by death, will be reunited with you. One day that father or mother will embrace you again. One day Jesus Christ will come. And one day the sorrow and heartache of earth will be over. Would you like to put your hand in the hand of Christ right now? Would you like to say, Jesus, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Lord, I'm coming to you. Lord, I want to see my father again. I want to see my mother again. I want to see my son again, my daughter again. I want to be caught up in that glorious joy when Jesus comes and live forever with them throughout all eternity. Listen. As Celestine sings, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Thou art calling Do not pass me by Let me at thy throne of mercy Find a sweet release Feeling there deep contrition help my unbelief and say Others, 
Jesus, the one calling to not pass me by. Here is the incredibly good news. He will not pass you by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. The thief on the cross in his dying breath said, Lord, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus gave the thief that day the assurance of eternal life. When the thief woke up that morning, he had no idea that his whole life would be changed that day. When he trudged up Golgotha's hill with Christ, he had no idea that his life would be changed that day. When they drove nails through his hands and he writhed in agony, he had no idea that his life would be changed that day. But in that moment, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, God spoke to him and he accepted the gift of eternal life. Right now, God is speaking to you. Right now, God is talking to your life. Maybe you had no idea that you would turn on Three Angels Broadcasting, but the Spirit is speaking to you. You can accept Christ right now. Through an act of your will, you can say, Jesus, I am yours. That choice changed the thief's life. And that choice will change your life right now as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you're moving by your spirit. Thank you so much that you're touching hearts through these programs. Thank you so much that somebody right now is coming to Christ and finding in Jesus security and hope and salvation. I pray for that person right now. May the Spirit move powerfully in their life and change them forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. This journey through Revelation is a journey to know Christ more deeply. It's a journey to follow Jesus more closely. It's a journey from time to eternity.